Since 1928, Evansville's Mesker Park Zoo and Botanic Garden has been educating families about conservation and animal lifestyles. The zoo's newest addition, Amazonia Forest of Riches, opened in 2008. At the 50-acre park, you see over 700 animals representing 200 species and natural habitats. I had an opportunity to meet up with marketing director Charlotte Raisner in the Amazonia exhibit and got a chance to see some things that most zoo patrons don't get to see. Thank you for coming. Um, so to start off, what are some of the specific ways you tend to the animals during the different seasons? The zoo is definitely a seasonal uh, type attraction even though we're open year round. A lot of the animals in the winter will be in their indoor enclosures, many of which have um, special viewing areas for indoor purposes. So you can see the animals pretty much year round, whether it's out on their exhibit or inside. We also, for some of the animals that prefer the outdoors or uh, can handle the winter climates, we either have in the summer ways to cool them off, like ice blocks, fans, um, misters, that sort of thing. And in the winter, maybe heat pads or um, just other space heaters, that sort of thing to help keep them nice and warm. So uh, it de definitely adds an element of challenge with the seasons, but our keepers are used to it. That's just part of their normal routine and uh, we make it work. Right, this being a botanical garden, what are some of the different ways you have to care for it? Well, we are a zoo and botanic garden, which a lot of people don't realize, but that's something we're really trying to stress. We have three greenhouses located here on zoo grounds, and we have a complete botanic staff that cares for these plants in the greenhouses year-round. They also plant the plants on grounds and um, also in Amazonia. So people always often ask, where is your botanic garden? Well, you're standing in it. The entire zoo is a botanic garden. We have different gardens located throughout the zoo. So in the summer, there's lots of weed pulling, um, irrigating, um, just general upkeep. We also do a lot of mulching and um, just keep the plants looking nice and healthy. And then of course in Amazonia, it's climate controlled and these are all tropical plants. So uh, there's times when these plants need pruned and also um, we do a lot of control on these animals with bugs, with insects. So we can't spray um, any kind of chemicals in here, so we release things like ladybugs to help, um, to help out with the different rodent problems that we could get. So how do you determine what kind of animals are featured at the zoo? We like to look at a big picture whenever we determine what our animal collection is going to be. We try to have a representation of lots of different species. So instead of having every single kind of monkey out there, we have a good representation of some of the different kinds of primates. Um, we kind of, our zoo is kind of laid out right now by region. Right now we're standing in Amazonia, which is a South American exhibit. And so all the animals are of course South American, but we tried to get a good representation from the forest canopy all the way down to the forest floor and talk about some of the animals and how they interact and just kind of tell a storyline with the different animals that we have in our collection. Uh, we also have a lot of SSP animals, which means they're part of the species survival plan. So lots of endangered animals here that we're working to actively either breed or help out with uh, supportive techniques to make sure these animals, um, their bloodline stays alive. So I read about Gaia, the new tiger. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about her? Yes, we currently have a female named Kashka and a mirror tiger on exhibit. And we've acquired another female uh, Amira tiger, and she came to us from the Cleveland Zoo. And the good thing about this is by acquiring this female, we're helping out with the species survival plan. Uh, this is a very endangered form of tigers, and we're not actively breeding because obviously we have two females. But what we did is we removed one of the tigers from Cleveland, brought her to us, and then now there's an extra space at Cleveland for a tiger so they can start actively breeding tigers. And so all these recommendations are made from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums um, SSP Species Survival Plan and they're looking at the big picture worldwide of this particular breed of tigers and how to best ensure that they stay um, alive and well and that we continue on the bloodline. What would you say would be one of the more high maintenance animals at the zoo? Um, as far as animals, no one particular animal is high maintenance. Sometimes the infrastructure, infrastructure that's required to keep that particular species is a little harder. 
So for example, Donna the Hippo, she has an indoor heated pool that we need to maintain the temperature of. So we have to have the boiler functioning properly to heat her water up every day. Or in Amazonia, some of the species in Amazonia, um, the aquatic species for instance, we have to make sure that they have adequate um, the temperature control is right and everything is perfect in their aquarium. So I think each particular species has a different set of challenges and uh, we do our best to accommodate those and keep them in the most realistic habitat possible for these animals in captivity. All right, since Amazonia is our newest exhibit and really, really cool, and we're standing right here, I'll take you guys on a little tour behind the scenes and you can see a little bit more than just the average visitor. And please step in the foot baths up here whenever you enter with both feet. This just helps reduce um, cross-contamination. Okay, this area is just kind of a staging area for some of the exhibits that you see in Amazonia. Um, there's crickets here that are fed out to different animals. Um, we also have some poison dart frogs. At certain times, the keepers actually um, grow the poison dart frogs from egg all the way up to frog. So that's just kind of a neat area to, uh, to see kind of the behind the scenes workings. All right, now we're gonna go downstairs and just kind of take a look at some of the animal holding areas. All right, this area is where some of our Amazonian animals are kept in the evening. So you can see there are very nice areas for the animals. Uh, the taper and capybaras are both kept in here. And the caging is designed, um, it's great technology, it's new, and it makes, it makes it easy for the keepers to clean, and it's, um, it definitely is very functional. Um, so in the event of like a natural disaster or some kind of emergency, how would you handle that? We actually all have radios, and so for every kind of scenario you can think of, we have a certain radio call that we would call. And so the big thing is, the number one list, we have obviously books and books filled with procedures, but the number one list in our risk management plan is visitor safety. So we want to ensure that all the visitors are taken to safety, um, no matter what the situation is. And then of course, the animal and employee safety is of utmost importance, so um, we have different teams gathered so if there would be an animal that would escape that could be dangerous we have a team that can actually dart the animal so um, you know to knock it down per se so that it can't um, do any harm and we can safely take it back to where it needs to go or to a containment area so yes definitely any situation you can think of we have a protocol to go along with that all right right now we're behind the scenes of what you see on the other side of us as the aquarium so to get that aquarium to look the way it looks, we have to have all of this in place to make sure all the animals are well taken care of. Um, all the systems that we have in here were thoroughly researched before we installed them, and our employees even went up to Shed Aquarium to see what they liked and didn't like about what they have at their particular facility because we wanted to make sure that what we get works for, works for our zoo and works for other zoos and aquariums. Uh, aquatic life is a whole new set of challenges, so we wanted to make sure we thoroughly did our research and got the equipment that would best maintain the aquatic life. Um, we've got a tank here that uh, if we're observing a particular species or if they're new and are still in quarantine, they'll be in here. Um, we've got all different kinds of um, pumps and filters and the standard aquarium stuff only on a large scale. So all of, this, all of these items are to ensure that the animals that you see out there are taken care of properly, that the water level, the water temperature, and the quality of water they're getting is um, the best it can be. Is there like a specific aquarium technician or is everybody trained kind of equally? The zoo is divided up into zones. So the people that are here in Amazonia, I think there's maybe three keepers. But this is primarily their area. They are thoroughly trained on this area. And then everyone else, they take care of it on a daily basis. And then all the other keepers are also trained. So if they needed, if someone wasn't here and they needed help in here, any of the keepers that are here at the zoo could perform that job as well. The reason why we built Amazonia, or one of the many reasons why we built Amazonia, is because we wanted something that was good for year-round visitation 
And so people can come to Amazonia at any given time and it's going to be a constant 76 degrees year round with uh, just some great, great humidity. You can feel the humidity just like you're in, in the rainforest when you walk in. So can you tell us about the new food commissary? Yes, we just opened that and uh, this is something that uh, Denny, our assistant animal curator, would be happy to show you and tell you more about. Uh, I am currently the assistant animal curator in the animal department, so I work under our animal curator. And then I work with a staff of 18 zookeepers at any given time. Mesquite Park Zoo wanted to build this commissary to really uh, transition from the past to, to the future of, of how we should be making diets for our zoo animals. And our older building, our older clay building, was where we previously made diets. And it was a tiny little kitchen, and it was separated from the, the produce cooler where all the, the, the food was stored by the keeper break room. So you had to lug food, animal food, across the people food area and then back to animal food area again. Um, it wasn't a great setup. We, and we had a freezer downstairs and we had a grain trailer out behind the building. So we consolidated all this into one building. And so we have everything we need now, um, uh, food prep areas, uh, the refrigerator, the freezer. We have a grain storage room, all in one nice tight little building and it allows us to elevate our standards here for how we make our diets. Uh, we actually have two zookeepers that are trained down here in our commissary, and they are our primary diet prep uh, personnel for this building. So it is all of our zookeepers actually make the diets here, and uh, they take turns coming in and doing it, but mostly these two guys. Um, we have worked really long and hard to, to um, develop a relationship with our suppliers for, for food that comes into the zoo uh, because we do expect really high quality produce and, and other items for these animals. Um, we, uh, as a zoo, we have to uh, develop our own standards and then work with USDA standard, standards and, and other national standards about, uh, you know, what kind of food we're feeding these animals. So. Our suppliers know that we want the same stuff that goes to the nice hotel down the street or the, um, the school lunchroom, any of that. We, we don't want um, older produce that nobody else really wants. So we do expect a lot out of our, our quality.